If it's Wednesday, the Harris Walls battleground blitz begins with back to back rallies in the crucial swing states of Wisconsin and Michigan as the race for the White House and the race to define the Democratic ticket heats up. Plus, Missouri Democrat Cori Bush becomes the second member of House Progressive's so called squad to suffer a bruising and expensive primary defeat to a Democratic opponent backed by a powerful pro Israel group. And the Biden administration rushes to ease simmering tensions in the Middle East as Iran and its proxies vow to retaliate against Israel after the assassinations of top Hamas and Hezbollah leaders. Welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Kristen Welker. The race is on to define the new Democratic ticket as that new ticket hits the trail. This was the scene just moments ago in Wisconsin as Vice President Harris and her new running mate, Minnesota Governor Tim Walz, holding rallies today in two critical Midwestern swing states. The Republican VP nominee, J.D. Vance, is also in those same two states today. The van's plane, in fact, could even be seen taxiing on the runway right behind Air Force Two at the airport in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. It comes as the Harris campaign hopes to build on Democratic enthusiasm and momentum, while the Trump campaign experiments with new lines of attack. In Eau Claire, the vice president echoing her newly minted running mate in front of an energized crowd as she made campaign promises on unions and health care. Understand, in this fight, As Tim Walls likes to point out, we are joyful warriors. Joyful warriors. It comes after Harris introduced Walls for the first time at a raucous rally in Philadelphia, leading into a message launched by the Harris team on day one of her campaign. Look. Tim and I have a message for Trump and others who want to turn back the clock on our fundamental freedoms. We're not going back. Some of us are old enough to remember when it was Republicans who were talking about freedom. It turns out now what they meant was the government should be free to invade your doctor's office. In Minnesota, we respect our neighbors and their personal choices that they make. There's a golden rule. Mind your own damn business. Walls also trotting out an attack line that has become a favorite of Democrats in the last two weeks, calling Trump and Vance, quote, creepy and weird. Today, the Trump campaign hitting back in a phone interview this morning. In fact, the former president calling Walls, quote, very liberal, while claiming that his selection over Pennsylvania's Jewish governor, Josh Shapiro, was proof of anti-Semitism inside the Democratic Party. This is a shocking, let me tell you, this is a shocking pick. And I think it's very insulting to Jewish people. And I think it's very insulting to people that want security. I think it's very insulting to anything having to do with making America great again. The Harris campaign and her supporters say those accusations are patently false. Meanwhile, in Michigan, Donald Trump's running mate, Senator J.D. Vance, a Marine veteran, laying into Waltz's military service. When Tim Waltz was asked by his country to go to Iraq, you know what he did? He dropped out of the army and allowed his unit to go without him, a fact that he's been criticized for aggressively by a lot of the people that he served with. I wonder, Tim Waltz, when were you ever in war? When was this, what was this weapon that you carried into war given that you abandoned your unit right before they went to Iraq and he has not spent a day in a combat zone? What bothers me about Tim Waltz is the stolen valor garbage. Do not pretend to be something that you're not. I'd be ashamed if I was him and I lied about my military service like he did. Well, the Harris campaign is responding this afternoon, writing in a statement, quote, after 24 years of military service, Governor Waltz retired in 2005 and ran for Congress, where he chaired Veterans Affairs and was a tireless advocate for our men and women in uniform. We have a big team of reporters starting us off today. Shaquille Brewster is on the ground in Wisconsin following the Harris Waltz rally earlier today. Garrett Hake is in Michigan, where J.D. Vance is campaigning. Also with me is NBC News Washington correspondent Yamish Alcindor. Shaq, let me start with you. You were at the rally in Eau Claire this afternoon. Talk about 
the enthusiasm on day two after this Democratic ticket has been unveiled? Well, Kristen, I'll tell you, among the core supporters here, the people who braved the long lines, who came out and dealt with the heat, there was a tremendous energy and enthusiasm around this new ticket. I'll tell you, there were people who were wearing homemade signs that you could tell uh, they made in the past 24 hours because it had the name of both Harris and Walls. You had people who said that they were taking off work to come here. And look, you see this kind of energy with, uh, with rallies like this. These are things that you normally hear. But when you talk to people, they say this is not how they felt just two and a half weeks ago. They feel like they have a chance to win this election. And everyone feels as if it's going to be close. But among the supporters, the people who are out here, they feel a new sense of excitement and enthusiasm. And you see that working its way up throughout the campaign. I'll tell you, uh, the campaign said about 12,000 people were here. There's no way to confirm that independently. But there's not just those numbers. But we do know that they raised about $36 million in the 24 hours after uh, Governor Walls was uh, announced as the running mate. When you talk to local Wisconsin Democrats, they're saying their uh, volunteer numbers, their door knocking numbers are reaching levels that they just haven't seen. So when you talk about the enthusiasm, that translates to energy, that translates to a ground game. And you have a lot of Democrats now feeling much more positively than they did uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Well, Shaq, speaking of positivity, a lot of people are taking notes of the messaging that we are hearing from Vice President Harris, from Governor Walls. They've been using yeah. words like joy. Uh, what is the strategy there and what can we anticipate moving forward? You certainly hear a few things. And, you know, one, we know that uh, in terms of this vice presidential pick, there are a lot of people who are frankly unfamiliar with him or, or have only heard one piece of his biography. So a lot of what we heard on stage was still that introduction for people here in Wisconsin. Look, this is almost a homecoming for uh, Governor Walsh because, you know, we are right along, uh, not far from uh, Minnesota. We're right along that border. So there was his family here that he acknowledged when he said, uh, Minnesotans, are you in the crowd? I almost want to say the majority of the crowd cheered and raised their hands. So uh, you had a sense that uh, this was a crowd that knew him. But when I talked to people, they didn't know much about him. They're still learning about him. And that's why you had on stage both Vice President Harris and Governor Walls still introducing uh, themselves to this audience here. But it's twofold because I talked to the head of the Republican, uh, the chair of the Republican Party here in Wisconsin, and he believes that this pick makes it easier for them. He says that Walls is too liberal of a candidate, too liberal of a governor, and that's something that they plan to use against him in this battleground state, Kristen. Well, that is certainly going to be one of the focal points of this campaign as Governor Walls tries to introduce himself to Americans. Seventy percent say they are not familiar with him. Shaq Brewster, thank you so much. Garrett Hake, let me turn to you. Uh, we, of course, today have heard J.D. Vance go very heavy on attacking Governor Walls for his military service. What is he saying? And uh, talk about the response. Well, Chris, I'm, this is kind of a classic example of a campaign trying to use their opponent's strength and turn it into a weakness. Here you have Democrats very happy to have someone with the military background that Tim Walls has on the ticket. Vance is pointing out two things. Number one, that uh, that Walls basically left his unit, which no one really disputes, in 2005 before that unit was set to be deployed to Iraq. Walls was planning to run for Congress. Um, the Harris campaign points out all the nice things he did for veterans and on the VA committee once he was in Congress. But the fact that he did not go serve in Iraq, which J.D. Vance himself did, albeit as a public affairs officer in the U.S. Marines, is a point that they are trying to make. And also, they're seizing on a comment that Walls has used in the past to suggest that certain weapons should not be in the hands of regular people. Weapons like what he carried in war is the quote from Walls. Vance seizing on that and saying, you were never in war, uh, Tim Walls, so what are you talking about there? And the Harris campaign has responded to that too as well, pointing out that Walls both carried, trained, uh, and is deeply familiar with the types of weapons we're talking about here, regardless of having never used them in combat. So maybe a small thing, but one of those stories that kind of gets out there and could get under uh, 
some voter skins, Kristen, it's worth pointing out that the campaign manager of the Trump team, uh, Chris LaCivita, you know, either the number one or two guy, depending on how you count it in the Trump world, is the architect of the swift boat attacks against John Kerry. So reaching deep into the playbook here for a very similar uh, way to undermine somebody's military expertise. Well, I think it's so important to bring up that historical reference, Garrett, because I think when you hear J.D. Vance make those attacks against Governor Walz, a lot of people remembering that moment. Yamish, let me turn to you to that point. Was the Harris campaign ready for this? We know that Governor Walz faced similar attacks uh, back in 2022. He was ready for it then. I have to assume he was ready today. I get the sense that the Harris campaign is ready for these attacks, but I have to tell you, Kristen, they're not engaging directly on whether or not he was falsifying his record, his military record. They are, of course, as you said, pointing out that he does have a history of service, both in the National Guard, but also as a teacher, as someone who was a governor, as someone who was a, a, con a congressional member. So they're sort of leaning in on the fact that he's someone who wants to serve America. And, he, and yesterday when he was in Philadelphia, he was also making that point, saying that they want this to be a people-powered campaign and a people-centered administration if they are elected to the White House. But it's very interesting to see them say, yes, he does have a sort of a, a long history uh, in the military and joined at 17, um, has trained people who did go into co combat zones, is what one source told me, but also is not engaging directly on whether or not he falsified here. And, Garrett, let's talk about a little bit more of what we're hearing from the Trump campaign, this uh, attack line trying to... Uh, accuse the Harris campaign of not picking, uh, of course, the governor of Pennsylvania, uh, Governor Shapiro, because he's Jewish, accusing basically Democrats of bending to what they say is anti-Semitism within the Democratic Party. Talk a little bit about that, because you actually confronted the senator about that. That's right, Kristen. I mean, this is somewhere between a full-on attack line and an old-fashioned dog whistle where the Trump campaign and their allies, including Nikki Haley, by the way, have either suggested or outright stated that the reason that Josh Shapiro, the governor of Pennsylvania, isn't on this ticket is because he's Jewish and because he has a position uh, in, uh, it's not compatible with Kamala Harris on the issue of Israel. And basically that Harris might have somehow, uh, you know, bent the knee to borrow J.D. Vance's nomenclature here uh, to anti-Semites in keeping uh, Shapiro off the ticket. I asked Vance today whether he has any specific evidence of that, especially given the fact that Kamala Harris is married to a Jewish man. Here's what he told me. I did not say that that was the only reason that Kamala Harris didn't choose Josh Shapiro. So you should, you know, take a little less DNC talking points when you ask your questions and ask a real question. I have suggested that Kamala Harris was motivated, or at least her party was motivated by anti-Semitism. And the evidence that I offer for that is what dozens of Democratic activists said in the run-up to her selecting her nominee. So, Kristen, I mean, you hear, you know, partly an answer, partly a way of trying to dismiss or belittle the question. I think this is one of those things that the Trump campaign hoped they could kind of inject into the conversation to create some friction and some disunity in the Democratic Party around this ticket. I'm not sure if it's going to have any legs, but I, I wouldn't be surprised to see that kind of whisper campaign continue, particularly at moments where the conflict in Gaza does flare up, does mm. kind of re-enter the mainstream of the American public consciousness on this issue, uh, you know, just because I think this is one of the areas where Republicans hope that there is some disunity among Democrats and maybe they can still kind of depress enthusiasm among Democrats on the Gaza and Israel issue specifically. Yeah, we'll watch that closely to see how much traction it does or does not get. Yamish, uh, let me ask you about this pick broadly, the decision to pick Governor Walz. Ultimately, what were the driving factors here? Well, it's a big, it's a good question and a key question. I just want to engage on what Garrett said really quickly, which is that let's remember that the second gentleman, and he mentioned it there, is Jewish American, but it's not just that he's Jewish American. He's history making. He's the first Jewish person to be the spouse of a president or vice president. And he's been working on Islamophobia and anti-Semitism in that role. And I interviewed him a few months ago and he told me that that was really important to him, anti-Semitism and Islamophobia, especially as there were all these protests on college campuses. So I just want to say that that's sort of part of what 
what we see when we're talking about sort of their pick and what they were thinking about. Um, th just making that point that that, that anti-Semitism and sort of suggestions of that, um, they, they just think that that's just not something that would really be accurate. Um, but that being said, there are a number of things that went into why Walls was picked, and one of them was that he was really just someone that the vice president thought in her gut would, would be trustworthy, would have her back, would also really resonate with rural Americans and middle Americans that are living in, in Midwest states. Um, he's also someone that has just like this biography that you could sort of almost have put into a box and said, well, what are all the things that a VP could be? And here he is with, with a history of fertility issues with his wife, a daughter named Hope, um, a teacher, a veteran, a gun owner, a, a governor, just so many different things that he checks the boxes for based on my reporting, talking to people in the Harris campaign. Well, great reporting all around by both of you, Garrett and Yamish. Thank you so much for starting us off. We really appreciate it. Joining me now on set is NBC News chief political analyst, Chuck Todd. Chuck, great to see you. Nice to see you. So let's talk about, I want to get to your column, but mm -hmm. before we get yeah. to your column, let's talk about these accusations by J.D. Vance mm -hmm. that uh, Governor Walz, when he was serving in the National Guard, left just as the Iraq war was getting underway and he ran for Congress. Or that unit was going to get deployed. Yes. The Iraq war Correct. had been going on was, for a few right. years. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But the, the question is, do you think, I mean, Garrett very smartly raises the historical context of this, that John Kerry, mm -hmm. of course, was swift boated and it did become a major issue for him. Do mm -hmm. you see parallels? Well, here's what I would say is, at a minimum, I think what the Trump campaign is hoping to do is Make it harder to send him into a military community. Make it so that this story, so when he goes to North Carolina to try to woo, where I think he could be helpful, to woo um, military veterans, or goes to an Arizona, or goes to a Georgia, three states in the battleground that all have higher than average uh, military veteran populations, that at a minimum this story trails him. That at a minimum there's somebody out there asking him a question about it. Um, so. This, this is one of those stories where it sort of does it, does the Harris campaign suddenly not put them in those mm. settings because they don't want, and maybe that's exactly what the Trump campaign is hoping for, that, you know, this is not, you know, we, we can, you can sit here and debate, he, he left when he left, um, it doesn't, you know, he was also had kids, maybe he was like, oh, I'm not going. And this is a time for me to go. I don't think he'd be the first military veteran who have made that decision. Hey, I had served my time. I had fulfilled mm -hmm. my duty that I agreed upon in order to qualify for the GI Bill, all those things. But it does probably make it harder for the Harris campaign to deploy mm. him specifically. In the, I have a feeling, and certainly what I think the Trump campaign hopes here. I don't think this is one of those where, oh, this... I'm sorry, if you're going to use a phrase, he used weapon of war and somehow say he right. was here. I right. think stolen valor is an absurd accusation. Yeah. But if you want to say, hey, you know, he didn't want to go um, and he decided, you know, look, this is this trailed Al Gore. You know, right. Al Gore right. never served in a war zone, per se, but he went. And but he would never talk about it because he didn't have to go out and see some of the of the worst stuff. Yeah. And he used to not talk about it for that it. reason for that reason because yeah. he didn't want people to think he was trying to so look in the military community this is a very sensitive yeah. stuff and, and and people you know now Donald Trump is somebody who got out of serving mm -hmm. so I don't think he can level this right which is why they're having JD Vance, Vance do it. level this accusation yeah. but I do think it, it it's I think more of an attempt to see hey is the way Garrett put it take what could be a strength and and you know, kneecap him on it yeah. a little bit. And yeah. that could be the end result here. I don't, look, I don't think he's, their explanation, the best version of it is, yeah, I didn't want to go. Right. Um, that's not exactly a way to go in and woo military veterans. Yeah, and I think to your point, it will be very fascinating to see if they pull him Just back from changes some of those that schedule communities. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about your column more yeah. broadly. You say the campaign reset is complete. It's not a Biden-Trump rematch. It's a whole new Ball game. I think sometimes we get jaded covering politics, but looking at the imagery last night, it, it just struck me the fact that two and a half weeks ago, right. the Democratic Party was basically in mourning. Right. And last night, whole different, as you say, ball game. It is. I mean, they basically caught up. Here's what hasn't happened, which is why Democrats probably ought to temper their enthusiasm. Their enthusiasm has caught up right. to where the Republicans are. 
Republican enthusiasm hasn't gotten, you know, we're not seeing, you know, there's a new Wisconsin poll out, one of the better ones, the Marquette poll, that shows that, among, you know, that basically Democrats have now pulled back even on enthusiasm to vote. But still among the most enthusiastic voters, yeah. Trump leads Harris. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, there is still, they still have a slight advantage on that. So the point is, is that that's what, it brings us back to essentially, we're back to, it's like we rebooted the computer yeah. And we're back to flatness, meaning we're back to our 21st century norm, which yeah. is we're deeply divided, deeply polarized, and a yeah. small slice of voters is going to decide who this is. Very quickly, because we're basically yes, out of I, time. I rambled a lot on But that first that's okay. It was an in-depth answer. Yeah, we needed to hear to be it. had to because of what that topic is. <laughs> yeah. Um, your reaction to picking Waltz, I mean, obviously, we yeah. haven't seen, uh, you know, since LBJ, a, a vice presidential nominee really help the top of the ticket mm -hmm. win the presidency since LBJ helped Kennedy win Texas. But... Well, look, Shapiro Kamala Harris is one. Popular, it is. It is. She has one piece of weird history on her side. The, the last two Democrats to put a uh, Wisconsin statewide, ele a Minnesota statewide elected official as a running mate won the presidency. And both of them didn't get second terms either. It was LBJ in 64 <laughs> and Jimmy Carter in 76. So, you know, they could, they could look at that. Look, yeah. I think when you look at it, which was she has a convention in two weeks, she's just getting the party back reunited after, after it was not reunited. I understand the rationale that says, hey, Shapiro would cause a minor brush fire. Kelly would cause a minor brush fire. We want no brush fires. Right. Walls gives them no brush fires. The convention's in two weeks. Perhaps this is a different choice yeah. if there's a longer run up, but it's not where we are. There, there's not time for brush That's fires right. from their perspective. Chuck, thank you. you got Great it. to be with you. Coming up, the very latest out of Georgia, where the state's election board has just approved new rules that critics worry could empower Trump allies to reject or delay the results in November. But first, the Midwest test. I'll talk to a Democrat who knows a thing or two about battleground voters in Michigan. Six-term Congressman Dan Kildee joins us from Detroit ahead of today's Harris Walls rally. That's all coming up next. You're watching Meet the Press now. Stay with us. Welcome back. After their rally this afternoon in Wisconsin, Vice President Kamala Harris and her running mate Tim Waltz are heading east across Lake Michigan for their second event of the day in Detroit. Joining me now from the site of the harris Walls rally in Detroit is Michigan Democratic Congressman Dan Kildee. Congressman Kildee, thanks so much for joining me. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Kristen. I want to get your reaction to this extraordinary moment. You were among those who stood by President Biden when some in your party were calling for him to drop out. Now that you see the reception, now that the new ticket is set, what's your take? What's your reaction? Well, I'm really enthusiastic. I'm all in. I think the president made the right decision. It was my view that he should be given the space to make that choice. He did. I think it was the right decision for him and the country. This is evidence of what that decision has unleashed. The level of enthusiasm, the number of new volunteers, the incredible outpouring of support, financial support, and people coming to events like this is the kind of energy that it's going to take to win what will be a very close race. Michigan could be a key. Here they are on their first full day as a ticket, and here they are right here in my home state of Michigan. Uh, I'm excited. I'm enthusiastic, as you can tell. So are a lot of other people. I can tell, and we can hear the crowds behind you. I want to play something that your colleague, Tom Emmer, had to say about Tim Walz. Take a listen. This guy who tries to come across as the affable Midwesterner is a left-wing radical who, under his failed leadership in just six short years in my state of Minnesota, uh, we've seen taxes skyrocket. Uh, Tim Walls is a great pick for the Republicans. Uh, it is just going to enhance uh, the radical left uh, shift. And the choice is going to be really simple this fall. That is basically, Congressman, the message that we are hearing from Donald Trump and Republicans uh, across the spectrum. How do you respond to that? And are you concerned about the policies that Tim Walz has enacted in the state of Minnesota that, that they opened him up to those attacks. Well, look, I expect that from Tom Emmer or any other of the Republican operatives. They're going to try to describe anybody who's a Democrat 
or a Republican that they don't like in the most negative terms. Tim Waltz is a moderate guy who has uh, deployed policies in Minnesota to support families. If they think that that's far too far left to support families that need help or to make sure that you know kids have a meal at lunchtime, we can have that conversation, and we will on the campaign trail. It points to exactly how far out of step with middle America the Republican Party has become. I served with Tim in the Congress. He and I are good friends. We just spoke last week. He was known to be a guy who was a pragmatic and practical policymaker. They don't like that. I understand. They're going to try to spin this any way they can. But Tim was a high school teacher. He's a veteran. He's a coach. He's a dad. He's just one of these guys that I think will, will, will play really well here in Michigan. Republicans don't like that, so they're going to try to create a new narrative around him. My view is let them have their say. Let them say what they want to say. Tim's authentic. Kamala's authentic. That message will break through. Well, one of his big challenges, quite frankly, is that a majority of voters just aren't familiar with him. In fact, according to the latest NPR Marist poll, 70 percent of respondents said they don't know who Tim Waltz is and fewer than other folks who almost uh, made the ticket, quite frankly. How does he introduce himself to the American public? And I know he was just picked yesterday, but does he need to flood the airwaves, do interviews? Obviously, we're expecting him to do a debate at some point. How does he introduce himself? Yeah, I mean, I think he needs to be out there in front of the American people, and we're doing that. He's starting right off, starting in Philadelphia, obviously in Wisconsin today, here in Michigan. I'm sure there'll be opportunities for him to, do, to sit down and do one-on-ones. But this is what the campaign is for, for us to make sure people know who we are and to make sure they understand who Tim Walls is. But here's the thing. They may not know everything about Tim Walls, but they know Tim Walls because Tim Walls is just like the neighbor down the street. He's a guy who thinks about his family, thinks about his community, and does what he can to make it better for, for his family and his community. So while they might not know him yet, they actually do know him. Because Tim is the, and he's a friend of mine, so I say this with a certain amount of bias. He's a guy, once you first meet him, you feel like you've known him your whole life. And, and, and I think they're going to love him when they do that, when they meet him. Congressman, I have to ask you about what has really dominated the headlines today, these attacks that we are hearing from J.D. Vance today, questioning Governor Waltz's military service, saying that he retired just as his unit was about to deploy to Iraq to avoid the war. How concerned are you about that line of attack, and, and how do you respond? I mean, the reality is he, the, you know, the campaign says, yes, he left after 24 years to run for Congress, that, but the reality and the timeline has not been questioned. Look, if the Republicans, if Donald Trump, for example, wants to lead a debate over military service to this country, and compare himself and J.D. Vance, who, while he did serve, you know, we can, we can examine his service. If they want to look at two decades of Tim Waltz's service to this country in the uniform of this country and then serving in Congress versus Donald Trump, who used every trick in the book he could to get out of serving his country, we're happy, believe me, happy to have that conversation. Congressman, are you concerned, though, that this could become a swift vote? Uh, campaign against him. You know, I think the American people are looking past that kind of that kind of attack. We're kind of used to it from the Republicans. Uh, look at Tim Walz is a wonderful, honorable guy who has served his country as a teacher, as a member of the U.S. military, as a member of Congress. Now, as the governor of Minnesota, his record stands on its own merit. They're going to attack him up on everything they can. They know that his biography is a strength. And that's why they're attacking him. They can always tell when the Republicans have fear because they begin to attack. And you know what? Let them, let them do what they want to do. We're going we're gonna to tell the story. We're going to make sure we tell a, a very clear story about the contrast, not just between the two visions of America, but between the people on our ticket versus theirs. And again, as I said, if they want to have a debate about the extent to which the candidates for president and vice president have served this country and been willing to do so over the long period of their lives, 
we are very happy to have that conversation, and I think we'll do quite well. All right. Congressman Dan Kildee, thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate your perspective. Thank you. I appreciate it. Coming up next, the stage is officially set for one of November's most closely watched Senate races, and a prominent House progressive is unseated by her own party in Missouri. Steve Kornacki breaks down last night's key election results at the big board. That's next. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. For the second time this summer, a member of the so-called squad has lost their primary. Democratic Congresswoman Cori Bush was defeated by Prosecutor Wesley Bell in Missouri's first congressional district. Bush has been a vocal critic of Israel's war in Gaza, and a pro-Israel group spent nearly $9 million on ads attacking her and boosting Bell. Her defeat comes less than six weeks after progressive Congressman Jamal Bowman, another critic of Israel, lost in his primary in New York. The stage is also now set in one of the most closely watched Senate races this November. Steve Kornacki is at the big board with more on yesterday's results. Yeah, the big headline last night, Cori Bush, incumbent Democrat, member of the so-called squad, losing the Democratic primary in Missouri's first congressional district to challenger Wesley Bell. Obviously, this attracted an unusual amount of attention for a House race. What happened? Well, basically, you could split this district into two parts. There is right here the city of St. Louis itself, Bush. This has been her base in the past. She won this by eight points last night. That's typically what she has done uh, when she won the seat originally. Originally in 2020, similar margin. Where she lost this race last night was in outlying St. Louis County, some more su suburbs of St. Louis. Here you see she lost that part almost by 15 points to Wesley Bell. When Bush first won this seat four years ago, she unseated a Democratic incumbent. She only lost this portion of the district by four points back then. It exploded to about 15 last night. That's the difference. That's why she loses the other high profile uh, primary last night. Not that it was competitive at all, but take a look up here. We're going to go to Michigan in the Senate on the Senate side Republican primary Mike Rogers easily wins that primary on the Democratic side Alyssa Slotkin member of the House easily wins that primary this is an open Senate seat but this sets the stage for what will be one of the most closely watched Senate races this fall Senate control obviously on the line the reality of this Senate race between Rogers and Slotkin Democrats this is really a must win seat for them they're clinging to that tiny Senate majority they've got a couple of red states where they have seats right now where they're playing Playing defense. Uh, they got to get through. They got to win two of those three red states, and then they got to protect states like Michigan. Uh, so obviously, this will be a huge, huge race this, uh, this November. See how it plays out. We sure will. Steve Kornacki, thank you so much. We are also following a primary that has yet to be decided in Washington state. Republican Congressman Dan Newhouse is currently trailing Trump backed candidate Jared Sessler. Newhouse is one of just two remaining House Republicans still in office who voted to impeach then President Trump in 2021. Well, staying on the topic of elections in Battleground, Georgia, the state's Board of Election has just granted new powers to local officials and Trump allies. The Republican-controlled board is now requiring officials to make a reasonable inquiry before certifying any results. Critics worry the vagueness of that wording could wreak havoc come November. Former President Trump, who pressured state officials to overturn the results in 2020, praised the board members by name during a rally in Atlanta over the weekend. I don't know if you've heard, but the Georgia State Election Board is in a very positive way. This is a very positive thing, Marjorie. They're on fire. They're doing a great job. Three members, Janice Johnson, Rick Jeffries, and Janelle King, three people, are all pit bulls fighting for honesty, transparency, and victory. They're fighting. Greg Bluestein is with me now. He's a senior political reporter for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution and an NBC News political contributor. Greg, thanks so much for being here. Really appreciate it. So let's just dive right in. What's the big takeaway here? What just happened? Well, by the way, I covered that rally on Saturday, and some of the loudest cheers went to those three pro-Trump uh, le state election board me members. And what just happened was there's a new rule change that was stalled before because there's a now a, a third member of the state election board who's 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 been siding with the pro-Trump uh, now majority, allowing this rule to go through. And it, it allows for a reasonable inquiry. But the problem here is it doesn't define what a reasonable inquiry is. And critics worry that it basically it's a pretext 
for uh, election board members, not just the state of Georgia, but also county election board members to hold up qualifying, to hold up uh, uh, certifying elections all across the state. And the issue here is it's happened before. Mm. You know, several Republican election board members in some rural counties have refused to certify election results election results earlier. Those were overridden. But now with this new rule change, um, it could be a major issue after the November election in Georgia if it's close at all, or frankly, even if it's not close, some major you know counties could hold up the vote. So just to put a fine point on this, Greg, could this actually mean that election results get overturned? Could that be the result of this rule change? It might m mean more of a stalling a tactic, you know, to delay the election results being certified. In 2020, the, gov the Governor Kemp, you know, one of the reasons why Donald Trump is feuding with him still to this day is because Kemp certified the election results. He said, hey, the Constitution required me to do so a couple weeks after the election. In this case, it might not lead to an overturning, but it could sow doubt. It could undermine confidence in the election results in Georgia. And we already have that problem that poll after poll after poll shows a significant number of Georgia Republicans still have doubts about the election system, still think that Donald Trump won the 2020 race, even though he didn't. Well, and just to follow up with you, Governor Kemp, uh, still steering the ship along with Brad Raffensperger, but does this actually take power away from them? How should we think about that relationship? Yeah, the state election board has shifted some of its power. It has more power than it did just a few months ago. Um, Raffensperger's not a, uh, a voting member of that state election board. It's kind of confusing how it's set up. Um, but, you know, it still gives state election board, uh, sorry, S Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger still has the power to oversee elections, and Governor Kemp still has that final say mm -hmm. on certifying the vote. So you've been talking to folks there. What has the reaction been there in Georgia to this development? We saw how they responded at the Trump campaign, but writ large, when you're talking to folks there, what are they saying? Do they have concerns? Well, there's three camps. There are the supporters of this issue who say that, you know, that the elect county election board shouldn't just rubber stamp uh, election results without knowing whether they were accurate. There are Democrats and, and voting rights advocates who worry about what we talked about earlier, that this just gives a pretext to, to stall the results and undermine confidence. And then there's the more mainstream Republicans. And one of them was, a, was the board chair who was appointed by Governor Brian Kemp, who did not side with this rule. And they also are concerned that this, these types of rules can be manipulated and taken advantage of and could, again, sow doubt in election results. So, it, you know, it's not a partisan uh, divide here. You, you have many middle of the road and many, many, frankly, moderate and mainstream Republicans who are also concerned by this. All right. Greg Bluestein, always covering all the angles for us. Thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Good to see you. After the break, a newly minted Democratic ticket, an evolving Republican strategy, and the debate over the debates. It's 90 days until the election. The panel's next. You're watching Meet the Press now. I figured I'd come by and uh, warn this thing good luck with the plane. Hopefully it's going to be my plane in a few months. But I also thought you guys might get lonely because the vice president doesn't answer questions from reporters and has it for 17 days. Uh, have they given you guys an explanation for why she won't take questions from reporters? Well, that was Republican, of course, vice presidential candidate J.D. Vance this afternoon during a very interesting split screen moment as both campaign planes and Vice President Harris's Air Force Two sat on the same tarmac in Wisconsin. As we mentioned, Vance is holding competing events in the same battleground states as the Harris Waltz ticket. Joining me now is my fantastic panel. Crystal is a founder of the So What newsletter and YouTube channel. Naveen Nayak, president and executive director of the Center for American Progress Action Fund. And Sarah Matthews, former Trump White House deputy press secretary. Thanks to all of you for being here. <clears throat> Naveen, kick us off your reaction to the pick of Tim Waltz and the crowds that they've been getting so far. I mean, the crowds, you know, I think most Democrats are like, we haven't seen this since 2008. It's got all of that sort of energy. Um, and I think the thing, the other thing that's probably getting less attention is, you know, the, very immediately the vice president sort of snapped back a part of the coalition that the mm -hmm. president had been struggling with, which was, you know, younger voters, communities of color, and I think that Wall's pick is not only in the short term, but for a long term, a real play to actually go back and talk to mm. the Midwest, upper Midwest, sort of working class voters that feel like maybe they had lost their place in the party. It's got 
the perfect story and I think is an incredibly effective communicator to those voters. Sarah Matthews, Republicans were concerned that Harris would pick Josh Shapiro, Governor Shapiro of Pennsylvania, and that that would give her strength in that critical battleground state. What are you hearing? What is so interesting is actually that both the right and the left seem to be happy with the walls pick because, as you mentioned, they, want, uh, they thought that it was going to be Josh Shapiro, yeah. and that got Republicans really worried, especially yeah. the Trump campaign. They know that Pennsylvania is going to be key for victory, and so they thought that conventional wisdom, she'll pick him because he could help secure that state. But it seems like that maybe they weren't necessarily the good fit. What we've seen is that, um, you know, he kind of has top of the ticket energy. And he was saying in these meetings with Harris that he wanted a bigger role as VP if he select or she selected him. And so it seems like Walls was a happy warrior and like, hey, I just want to go out there and do what I can to help. And so they seem to be a better fit. They have better chemistry. Like I, I, I would personally have wanted it to to be Shapiro, but I also now see that the more I've seen from Walls, I understand why he's the pick. He is this nice, normal Midwest guy. I'm from the Midwest. He reminds me of a lot of dads mm -hmm. that I know back home. Mm -hmm. And I do think that people are craving a normalcy in our politics, and he provides that. You make such a great point, Sarah, which is that I think so many people, a number of people who I spoke with initially were scratching their heads, but then once they saw the chemistry, once they saw that Governor Walls was comfortable, Chris Silliza, mm -hmm. in that number two position. Yep. They changed your position. But here's what you posted on X yesterday. Oh, boy. Right after. Yes, I have nightmares that begin which, with those lines. Which got our, <laughs> which got our attention. Um, you basically said that it was a weird choice. Has your opinion changed? What do you think? So, a little bit. Um, I thought, and I think, mm -hmm. that Josh Shapiro was the better pick. It's simply because I'm a sort of numbers and math guy, even though I wasn't great at math. I fashioned myself a numbers <laughs> and math guy. And to me, like, uh, Kamala Harris has to win Pennsylvania to get elected. Yeah. There are other ways, but it's hard, right, right. to get to 270. Right. So my view is, yes, the VP only matters marginally. I accept that. they wouldn't. If Josh Shapiro was the nominee, it's not going to be 60-40 Kamala Harris in, in November. Right. But if it's a point or two in a close race, you have to win. So I still think Shapiro is the better mm. one. But I'm going to steal for the future. I'm just saying this publicly. I'm going to steal <laughs> Sarah's big uh, top of the ticket energy line. Because <laughs> I think that's actually true. They did right? have top of the ticket like, if energy. You watch that, if you watch that rally yesterday, yeah. like just me as like an observer, like Shapiro was really good. Like as someone who's watched politics for a really long time, like really charismatic, really energetic. And Walls was not bad, but different. Right. right. And so I right. think I think right. the calculation I make is like, well, who can get you to this vote? I think the calculation that a politician makes, we forget they're people. Right. We kind of forget that sometimes. They're not just people you move around on a chessboard. <laughs> and I think she wanted someone after three and a half years of an okay relationship with Joe yeah. Biden, kind of never yeah. feeling that she was in the start. Someone who she trusted, uh, who she felt like she could be a good partner with. And I think this is important, someone who was going to put Kamala Harris first, not Josh Shapiro first, yeah. and I think that does matter. Yeah, so, so weird was an unfortunate, like many things yeah. I put on Twitter, look, that's the problem. Like, it takes two seconds attention. to type something out, and then it stays forever. But he's a totally fine, serviceable pick. We may look back, and it was a brilliant pick. Right, right. I would have picked Josh Shapiro, but that's also why I'm not the nominee for president. As we're having <laughs> this conversation, we are looking at uh, the vice president, Governor Walz. Uh, they are departing. Eau Claire, Wisconsin, uh, about to take off, head to Michigan for their second rally that'll happen a little bit later on this evening. Naveen, what about this argument that Chris is making that, like, boy, if Pennsylvania's close, you kind of want a Josh Shapiro, even though we should caveat it's been a long time. You have to go back to LBJ before a vice presidential, someone number two on the <laughs> ticket actually carried a state yep. and helped win the presidency. Yeah, and I, I think the other point is, even if you win Pennsylvania, it's not enough. Yeah. So, like, Pennsylvania's got to be tagged on with, you know, most likely with Michigan. Wisconsin and Michigan. Yeah. And Tim Walls is a guy who not only can be really effective in Wisconsin, where he's right next door, but it's the same voters that Democrats have to go win in the middle of Pennsylvania, right? Mm -hmm. That in in parts of Wisconsin, that he is going to be, you know, he can go to a place where Democrats have struggled to actually go and show up, and I think he can go there authentically, not yeah. like he's there for votes. It's like these are my people, and when you hear him talking about it, 
They really are. Yeah. He's comfortable there. Sarah, one of the things that's so interesting, he really was the first person, to borrow a phrase from Chris Eliza, <laughs> who used the term weird to talk about Republicans. And it was a shift in the narrative in a way, because under Biden, there had been so much focus. Donald Trump's going to be a, a greater threat to democracy in a second term. And there was, I think, a sense and a concern that that wasn't resonating with younger voters. So here you had Governor Walsh come and say, like, no, some of their policies are just weird. Do you think that sticks? Does that work? Is it strong enough as someone who has talked about your concerns about a second Trump administration? Yeah, I've often talked about my concerns, and it is kind of strange sometimes when you're trying to paint this existential threat of, oh, a second Trump term and what they would do. And, and I do think that that might not be the right message for certain voters. And so, as you mentioned, the weird message seems to be breaking through uh, with young voters in particular. And it's resonating with them because they do see some of these policies that Trump um, and Vance would enact as weird. And they see a lot of J.D. Vance's behavior as weird. And he's this kind of awkward uh, guy. And so it did seem to land. And that was, I think, a big reason why Harris picked Waltz is because he's a great messenger. And he was able to kind of shift the messaging on the Democratic side. Uh, you saw plenty of Democrats then pick up that line of mm -hmm. weird, not even just Harris. It was other Democrats as well who started incorporating it. And it, it seems to be effective. And so I do think that he um, is a great messenger and is an asset to the ticket in that way. Yeah. So what's weird, I know, <laughs> I know, I apologize. Um, <laughs> no apology <laughs> necessary. What's weird actually about Trump, to Sarah's point, is that... Like, yeah. He seems to be like someone you would think would be easy to attack and get hits mm. on because he says so many things where you're like, holy cow, like that seems wild. And yet it is hard. It has been harder than I think Democrats thought to really cut through yeah. in some meaningful way. Right. The democracy thing didn't really work. Right. Candidly, in January 6th, and, you know, election stuff. The weird thing, which is amazing that I'm kind of like offhanding, like, oh, the attempt to overthrow our democracy, eh, not right. a big deal. Right. Uh, but for a lot of voters, it didn't cut through. But the weird thing sort of did. And I, I do think like Democrats struggled yeah. to find I mean, yeah. Look at the 2016 campaign. Hillary Clinton struggled to find a message that really like cut yes, Donald it. Trump. You know right. what I mean? That really right. like got right. in there and did actual damage with right. people who are persuadable right. voters. Right. Yeah, and here's the thing that I think will be a challenge with it, though, is like, we have to remember, Donald Trump has never won a majority. Mm -hmm. I mean, right. he's been up 40. He can't win a majority in this country. There is a solid 55% of Americans who don't like him. I'm not sure that weird is going to dislodge the 46%. Yeah. And I think, you know, everything he's done has kept that base. But he's not building anything more. All right. Well, a lot to watch. Thank you all for being here. Chris Naveen and Sarah, appreciate it. Fantastic conversation. Still to come, one of the architects of the October 7th terrorist attack on Israel has been named Hamas's new political leader. As the U.S. and Israel remain on high alert for a retaliatory strike from Iran, we've got the very latest from the Pentagon. Stay with us. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. Yaya Sinwar, one of the architects of the October 7th attacks, has been elevated as the new political leader of Hamas following the assassination of Ismail Haniya. The move is a sign of defiance from the terrorist organization and could further complicate ceasefire talks given Sinwar's hardline ideology. It comes as Israel and the entire region are on edge as it waits to see how and when Iran will retaliate in response to the assassinations of two prominent militants. The Biden administration is continuing its efforts to de-escalate tensions both behind the scenes and in public remarks. Joining me now is Courtney QB, who is at her post at the Pentagon. So, Court, let's talk about the very latest. It's been a week since uh, the strikes in Beirut and Lebanon on the militant leaders. What do you make of the fact that we haven't seen any retaliatory strikes yet? Are you anticipating them as the military? We, uh, yeah, I mean, there's still a widespread belief there will be some sort of a retaliatory action here by Iran. But you're right, it's been a week since we saw that assassination of Ismail Haniya in Tehran. We have seen many, at this point, public pronouncements from Iranian leaders saying that there will be some sort of a response. But I will say, Kristen, 
Iran does not always respond immediately. You can look back to when so um, uh, you can look back to 2020. It was when um, the assassination of a leader then in Iraq by the U.S. It was more than a week before Al Assad Air Base was actually struck with missiles by Iran. You can look back to just April. It was days before Iran responded, striking, uh, uh, firing off about 300 projectiles towards Israel. So it's not super surprising that they haven't responded yet. But we do expect something. The big the big question is, what could this look like? Everyone is pointing back mm. to April when those projectiles were fired off. You remember, of course, Kristen, most of them were shot down. They were intercepted before they actually landed in Israel. It was a multi-country effort to do that. The question is, will we see something similar this time? And the reality is, we just don't know yet, Kristen. Yeah, I mean, I, that leads me to my next question, Court, which is just how much insight does the Pentagon have at this point about Iran's military capability? Abilities about potential options that they're considering. They know a lot about their capabilities, but the options may not be as clear in this case. So they know they have the ability to fire off drones and missiles, projectiles. They also know that they have a, a lot of control and influence over many of these militia groups in the region. We often call them Iranian-backed militia groups. The belief is that they could play a role here, according to U.S. Mm. officials, in some sort of a response. But again, the capabilities are known, but what exactly Iran has decided to do, or frankly, if they're still deciding how they want to respond here, I'm assuming there are people in this building who know a lot more mm. than you and I do about this, <laughs> but at this point, we really don't have a whole lot of fidelity about what this could look like. Again, everyone is pointing back to yeah. April, but it's not 100% clear that that's what this is going to look like again, Kristen. Well, I know you will get the information first when it becomes available. <laughs> Courtney, thank you. It's great to see you as always. Thanks. We are back tomorrow with more Meet the Press Now. The news continues with Hallie Jackson right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.